Warning, the following program contains scenes of death. This is a death bug joint, motherfuckers. California, 1970s. It's easy to see why they have the highest amount of serial killers in the world. A virtual buffet for the psychologically disenchanted. Where all you gotta do is throw a rock and you'll hit a cocksucker or an opportunist. But do me a favor, if you're gonna throw it, throw it hard. And while we're on the subject, meet one Herbert William Mullen. Classmates in high school voted Herb most likely to succeed. Apparently, he had an overall charm and disposition, which I guess means that men wanted to be him and women wanted to fuck him. But little did those classmates know that they were truly in the presence of greatness. And by the time he was 25, on a self-professed mission from God, he would prematurely send 13 men, women, and children into the abyss. Acquaintances of Herbert's notice a change in his final year of high school. He'd been doing a lot of LSD, smoking weed, you know the score. And I guess that this is around the time that God showed up and laid out a plan for him. And it was on this mission that he was apparently told that he had to take lives to save lives. Huh. I guess if you're gonna make an omelet, you gotta break some eggs. Nice. That's fucking nice. Santa Cruz, Cali, 1970s. It's safe to say that it was home of the Bohemian, where the air permeated sensuality, where every free spirit came to its beaches to practice the art of letting go, where it was just as easy to score a bag of weed as it was to get a cup of coffee. But it also earned the dubious title, a murder capital of the world. But I suppose that any true enthusiast would say, why let a few stiffs spoil the party? There's an old expression that God is hardest on the poor. And I guess to prove that point, he decided to give a little example. Lawrence White, known as Whitey to his friends. Well, he'd had a tough life. His kid died, alcoholism, his wife left him. I guess life gave Whitey lemons, and he didn't feel like making lemonade. They found Whitey's body at the side of the highway. They figured he'd been out hitchhiking. He'd been beaten to death with a baseball bat. His head looked like a bowl of guacamole. All it was missing was the nachos. And whoever did it looked like it was personal. But by all accounts, Whitey didn't have an enemy in the world. But I guess all it takes is having one. And the cops never paid Whitey no much never mind. And they were hardly gonna call out Starsky and Hutch on the case. Because Whitey wasn't the first stinky hobo to end up a stain on the sidewalk. And he wouldn't be the last. When 24-year-old Mary Guilfoyle wasn't hiding behind trees, she was a popular college student, a free spirit who believed in peace and love and wasn't adverse to taking rides from strangers. Didn't your mama tell you that you shouldn't ought to taking rides from strangers? Found by a jogger with a week's worth of rod, and what was left was a mess. Poor Mary'd been gutted like a fish, a college-educated fish. Her intestines had been cut out and strewn all around her, and she hadn't even been fucked, which mean cops were having a difficult time finding a motive. Question, who guts and cuts up a woman who rips out their intestines and doesn't even fuck them? Nah, maybe I'm being too analytical, but either way, it seems like a census crime. And I guess the cops agreed, because they came out and told the public that they didn't have a clue. Everybody's got to meet their maker. But I'm guessing Catholic priest Father Tomei didn't think he'd be meeting his maker so soon. He'd been found beaten sitting in his confessional booth with a knife through his heart. So I'm guessing that whomever was confessing to him didn't really mean it. The cops didn't have a clue what the motive was. At first they thought it might have been some sick fuck fag thing and he were up to no good. But after doing a little poking around, the priest was as clean as a soul on a cripple's boot. If friends and family are to be believed, growing up, 
Herb Mullen's life was idyllic. The youngest of two kids having an older sister. With his parents strict Catholics, his father a former Marine and now a postman. He was a polite, popular, well-regarded kid. And this carried over into high school, where he had a long time steady girlfriend, got good grades, participated in all the sports. But by all accounts, this all changed for Herb when his best friend died in an automobile accident. The young teen was devastated, and he set up a shrine for his best friend in his bedroom. So much so, he told his girlfriend he was worried that he was turning into a homosexual, and he tried to burn off his own cock with a cigarette lighter. Now incessantly having conversations with himself, and he began sending nonsensical letters to complete strangers and signing it, The Human Sacrifice. So around this time, perhaps to escape the pain he was feeling, he started using drugs, smoking weed, doing LSD. This also affected his personality further, and the dedicated Catholic dropped Catholicism like a retard's tongue at an ice cream tasting party, and took up Eastern philosophies, you know the types where their gods got eight arms. And although his parents were loving and supportive, they were baffled and scared by their son's unusual behavior. It was after finishing high school that he moved out of his house and started living in the hippie slums of San Francisco. It was after living in San Francisco for a year, taking drugs, dropping acid, that he got evicted from his apartment for banging on the floor and screaming at the walls. With his mental health now disintegrating by the day, he decided to try to sort himself out and join the army, just like his father had. But they rejected him because he was fucking crazy, and he showed up back at his parents' house with a shaved head, and they were alarmed. Now needing to point the blame into his rejection into the army, Herb figured his friend who sold him drugs in high school was a good place to start. So he figured he'd come by his house and say hi. But when he knocked on the door, Jim Gennaris no longer lived there. But a woman now living there with her two kids kindly gave a forwarding address. Herb, who had now bought himself a gun, didn't want to waste any time, so he immediately drove over to his former classmate's new address. And when he knocked on the door, I guess he wasn't in the mood for pleasantries, cause he shot Gennaris in the throat. <coughs> then he dragged his former amigo upstairs, and as his wife got out of the bath to greet them, he stabbed her. Then finished the couple off with a bullet each to the head. And for reasons known only to Mullen, he decided to go back and return to Jim Gennaris' former address and the woman who had kindly enough provided the information to where he'd moved to. And by all accounts, the murders were brutal. And Kathy Francis fought hard to save her two young children. Her old man was out completing a drug deal, so she was left home alone. It was just after dinner. The two kids had just had their bath and were in the bedroom playing Chinese checkers. Mullen walked up to the front door, knocking. Kathy would have recognized him from that morning and invited him in. It was then he pulled a gun on her and shot her in the forehead. And then stabbed her after she was dead. Walked into the kid's bedroom, gave him a bullet each in the forehead, and stabbed him post-mortem. He then finished a bar of freshly brewed coffee and left. The bodies were found a couple hours later when Kathy's old man returned home from his deal. Drugs really do kill. It's not unusual for schizophrenics to place a significance in numbers and their meanings. In notes later found by Mullen's ex-girlfriend, his twisted doctrine was revealed on how he was the anointed one and was born to save California and her people from an imminent earthquake. Mullen had come across a significant date because Albert Einstein was born on his birth date, which coincided with the great San Francisco earthquake. And he came about the theory that Einstein died to protect people born on April 18th. Are you still following me here? Good. And now it was Mullen's job to do something great or heroic to save everyone else. By studying numbers, Mullen believed that when the population got too high, there were accidents, war, and natural disasters to balance things out. But with the Vietnam War wrapping up, the numbers were down. So Herb figured if he started killing people, he could stop San Francisco from sinking into the sea. 
and since he'd been anointed the 13th Apostle, God had given him a hard pass, so to speak. And that's why he chose the 13th day of October to begin his killing spree. Huh? Making sense to you now? No, it doesn't make sense to me either. But little Herbie was, when I met him in Redwood City Jail, okay, our first meeting was I bumped him out of the priority cell where they could look from the office and see through the steel door, the glass in the door, and see him physically, or they could watch the monitor and watch him. He got bumped next door. There was a shower in the priority cell. Never had to leave the cell. For him to shower from the other cell, he had to go out into the main area. They had to lock everybody in one of the, uh, uh, I guess you call them tanks. They moved 15 guys, 30 guys out of the tank into the activity area. They'd walk him around into their tank. He'd shower. He'd come back out. And all the way over there and all the way back, they're cat calling him. They're calling him names. They're yelling because he caused them great interruption in their day, right? He resented that. He got bumped out of the priority cell into a non-shower cell. I got the shower cell, right? So he wasn't too friendly at first. And I'd say, uh, excuse me, Mr. Mullen. I says, do you have a bar of soap? There's no soap over here. He took it all with him. He had no need for it, but he took it with him. And he'd say yes, and I'd say, well, can I use a bar of it? He said, no. And I'd say, oh, I got one of these little shits here. And what it is, he's a little wimpy guy that hates big guys because he always feels intimidated by them, right? And that's how we started out. So I started thinking about that, and I went back to my old relationships in therapy and group therapy and Tascadero and youth authority and stuff, and I'm saying, okay, well, we can deal with this. So I started, I said, well, I have to be kind to him. So I found out something he liked. He loved planters' peanuts, little bags of peanuts shelled peanuts and uh, so I bought 20, 30 bags of them. I didn't care for them myself. And uh, I offered him some one day and they were both on camera 24 hours a day. So I said, Herbie, would you like some peanuts? And he'd say, yeah. And I'd say, oh, I got to him. Right down to the inner core there. Yeah. This little childhood thing comes out. And I says, oh, here. And he was fascinated by this thought of, gee, he's just giving me some peanuts and I didn't do anything for him. Uh, I don't know him. He, you know, I'm not being nice to him. Why would he give me some peanuts? So he comes over to the bars. We can't even see each other. And I reach out with these peanuts around the side. And I see this little hand come out. And it, I thought of it almost as a little monkey paw. It's what it seemed like. So innocent. And this little, little hand comes out, starts to reach for the peanuts. And then he, and then he hesitated. And then he pulls back. And I thought, oh, geez, he's defensive. He's thinking I'm going to grab his hand and rip his arm off or something. I'm this great big guy, right? So without saying anything, I just reached around and I laid him on the bars and then pulled my hand away. And he took them and he enjoyed them and all of that. And I'd say later, I'd say, gee, uh, Herbie, did you eat all those peanuts? And he'd say, oh, no, I still got some left. I said, well, I got plenty more. I said, go ahead and enjoy them. So what I did is I started giving him bags of peanuts. And he had this horrible habit. There's guys back in the tank, and he and I are in these cells facing them through three bars, three sets of bars. And I can't see him, and he can't see me. I don't know where on this set of bars he is. The set of bars is maybe nine feet wide and, you know, eight or nine feet high. And when he would get to acting up, he'd sit there for hours writing and writing at this little desk. And uh, the other guys were ignoring him. So that night they're watching Saturday Night Special, you know, with all this rock music playing and stuff, and they're enjoying it. And he'd get up and make this real loud speech about how bad television is for you and why you shouldn't watch it. All the things it'll do to you. And they're having fits. They're trying to throw things at him. They can't get at him. They're raging. They're mad because he's destroying the one thing they really enjoy. And he's just having a ball doing this. He'll sit for hours all day writing this two-hour speech, exactly as long as it takes to watch that show. So he'd also sit over there and sing these horrible songs. He couldn't sing a lick at all. And he's singing these horrible songs. And one time I was in the car coming back to Redwood City, and the cop got so upset at the singing he's doing in the back of the station wagon, he turns around with his can of mace. He says, I've had it. Get out of the way, Kemper. And I'm saying, hey, wait a minute. You're going to get me with that stuff. And he's trying to mace the guy in the back of the car because he won't shut up. And he's trying to get him to shut up. And the guy just ignored him. He had this way of really getting in people's nerves. So he'd pull these little stunts, these horrible songs and the speeches and things. And I'd say, Herbie, why do you do stuff like that? And he says, oh, I have a right to do what I want to do, too. And then, yeah, OK, right.
It was four teenagers who set out on an adventure into the great outdoors. But little did they know that it was an adventure that they weren't coming back from. Investigators figure that Herbert Mullen walked in about seven o'clock in the morning as the boys were making their breakfast. And he shot each of them in the head, execution style. One bullet each. And if it weren't a mess, I guess it'd do until one got there. And when forensics gutted the stiffs, they found out that they hadn't even eaten their breakfast yet. Meaning that Mullen killed them and then stopped the eating. And Cali cops were baffled because whomever were doing the killing, that didn't seem to be any M.O. Uh, there's no question about it. Very unusual. Uh, we haven't had anything like this in Santa Cruz County before and, and I hope to God we never have anything like this again. And I'm guessing what he means in layman's terms is it's the first time they had a serial killer who weren't interested in pussy. Uh, shot, this is all I can tell you, through the preliminary examination. We don't know whether it's once or twice, sir. Or... How long were the bodies there? We don't know that yet. That should be determined tomorrow morning. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, sir. Front of the head. We can't tell yet. Right. You have slugs? Slugs in the body? There's projectiles in the head. There will be some kind of ballistic things eventually. Hopefully, they won't very dead. Yes. It was early on a Sunday morning and Fred Perez was out doing his gardening. And a car drove by and shot him once through the heart. The poor bastard never knew what hit him. But as the vehicle was driving away, a neighbor saw the whole thing and called in the license plate number. And cops pulled over the vehicle less than a mile down the road. When the officer approached the car, there was a rifle sitting on the seat beside Mullen. And Herbert Mullen's reign of terror was now over. Just 
the book says, no more.